Welcome, everybody. I hope you enjoyed your meal. Yes, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Paul Hunziker over there, who did, did it all this morning and all last night to cooking that food. And all of our other volunteers and members that brought food, I appreciate all their contributions for today. Today is the first annual Kashubi Immunity Day for Winona, Minnesota. So Kashubi Immunity Day has been celebrated all across Poland. It started in Gdansk in 2005 after the 2004 recognition of Poland as Kashubi as a nation. And so in 2014, when it developed its language system that was taught in local schools, uh, we still continue this tradition in Poland. There was a little hiccup with 2020, and so I don't have that updated information for you. Uh, but it does transfer from one city to another, uh, and they celebrate it through uh, not only a march, but the Abashka tournament and a, and a celebration like this with Kashubi food and Polish uh, food as well, uh, to celebrate this day is in recognition of the first time that the Kashubians had been mentioned in, in church records. And so it was a papal bowl in 1238. So before we get in much into the history, I'd like to share with you the legend of Kashubians. And it starts with the annual Kashubi. Uh, we commence with the legend titled Aniel Kashub, the Angel of Kashubia, which describes how the region came into existence. After God finished creating the world, he asked his angels about their opinion of his work, and all the angels enthusiastically clapped their hands and gave their praise, all but one. The individual angel pointed out to God that Kashubia could use some enhancements, as it contained nothing but sand. The Creator reacted nimbly to the angel's advice and embellished the region. God spoke an almighty word, and the miracle occurred. In the middle of a sandy Kashubia, hills appeared, covered with rustling trees. And between the hills, blue ponds shone brightly. These were beautiful lakes full of tasty fish. Afterwards, God raised his hand and a great griffin appeared over Kashubia. The mythical creature flew over the region and dropped a great piece of amber into one of its lakes. Should Kashubia ever experience poverty, this immensely valuable piece of amber will be discovered and the region will be saved. As for the angel who voiced his concerns to God, he became the guardian angel of Kashubia. And that is where the griffin originally comes from, is this story, this legend. Uh, most of you have seen pictures of Kashubians and their local dress and their folklore, uh, but they are specific to the green and blue overcoat uh, vest with the Kashubian embroidered shirt, white pants, and a silver vest underneath. Uh, there is the yellow variation that you often see, however, the original is a white vest and white clothing underneath. So in my, when I began this study, the last time that I could find anybody that was analyzing Kashubian history is uh, in 1939. Uh, as far back as 1935, a man named Adam Fisher wrote a book called The Kashubian Civilization. It's available in the Museum for Research. Uh, and it does go through a lot of the, the Kashubian population, their social structure, the different things that they did, uh, and their, uh, their surroundings uh, and how they interacted with the Baltic Sea and the farmland of, in, in Kashubia. However, uh, in the United States, there was a debate going on in 1939, before World War II, of whether or not Kashubia was its own nation. And so the many scholars got together from England and all over the world and they went to Kashubia and they studied them and that's where that book comes from. In the United States, it was being debated uh, hotly in St. Louis, uh, the St. Louis Star and Times and a couple of newspapers around the world, or around the nation. And what they were talking about was whether or not Kashubia could be its own nation when it comes to drawing these new borders of World War I and World War II. Um, but what they ended up deciding was that it was not that while the language was different, the culture was not different enough to be Polish, uh, different enough from Polish to be its own nation. Um, that's what, what they come up with. However, you know, it, it's these people that are drawing the lines, and so it's not necessarily vindictive of what the people are or their history. But this is the debate in 1939 and why Kashubians are kind of stricken from the record. Uh, because there is this national movement going on and only the country of Poland matters, not its individual parts. Uh, and so they disregarded it and stopped talking about it. Uh, this was pretty much the last time that Kashubia is printed in newspapers all the way until 2004. So what we're really talking about is these West Slavic languages. Okay, in the original 700s, uh, what we have is several different languages, the Polans, the Lindians, Silesians, Vens, Sorbs, Vistulans, Palabians, Obatrites, uh, all the way down to Kashubians. 
And if you see up there, it's kind of hard to tell, but in the dark red area on the Baltic Sea is where the Kashubian language spread to. Now it spreads all the way, the Kashubian language is, is spoken all the way to Lübeck, Germany in the beginning, okay? And what they would do is as soon as the Germans tried to take over, uh, they would take that language and speak it inside their homes. Um, and so they're not actually uh, getting rid of it or assimilating, but they are being forced to uh, bring their culture inside so that nobody else can see it in the public, but are still allowed to celebrate it inside their homes. And so that's where that Kashubian note comes from. Uh, it's uh, symbols and, and different parts of the history that allow the children to still speak the Kashubian language and understand parts of its history. So the fenning uh, is one that I point out the most. Uh, because the fenning is originally a part of this Bendish coinage union, and so are the Kashubians. Uh, there's just another rendition of the different parts, and it stretches all the way to the island of Rügen, and all the way up by Denmark. Uh, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is basically this idea of the Polish question. Okay, so it's from the beginning Crusades all the way through to the Lieber's Nam of 1939, which was the policy to get rid of the Polish people by, Germ by the Nazi Germany. So when we start, we hit, pick up an old map, and this is a German map that depicts the different Slavic peoples that they're trying to assimilate. And if you notice, Kashubi is not up towards by Gdeis, but over on the left end of that, of that little peninsula. And so that whole area is really what Kashubia is. It's, it stretches all the way to Stetchen, all the way up to Kaliningrad, and that's the language that is spoken in the northern Baltic states. Uh, one of the reasons that it spread beyond just its local population was the fact that they were part of this Hanseatic League and Bendish Union, and so they were trading economically as far as England and into Russia. There are many different populations that you can see and how they're depicted. And what this is, is uh, it was coined by a guy named William Fritz in 1976. And what he calls this area is Germania Slavica. Okay, and this is the policy of German Austrian that is transforming these Slavic populations and moving closer into Poland, taking over its populations and making them a serf population. And this starts really uh, well before this, but this is the, one of the most monumental points. Uh, what we have is in 1230, we have the Teutonic Knights and the Prussian Crusades. Uh, this policy was meant to, uh, in concordance with Poland, to conquer the Prussian states, uh, or the Baltic areas. There was a pagan tribe that lived there, and they were not Christianized by 1500s. So they were still practicing some of these old Slavic traditions, and were not Christianizing into the Catholic faith. Uh, and so they, uh, Poland and the Teutonic Knights made a deal and allowed the Teutonic Knights to enter into the area and start Christianizing the, the Slavic populations. <coughs> so just, just eight years after, March 19th, 1938, or 1238, excuse me, Pope Gregory IX is the first person to mention the Kashubians in surviving texts. So this is the first known and the first day that we would know about Kashubia in far, as far as historical documents and things like that. And that's why this day is pretty important, is because it marks this first time that we are recognized. Um, and it's because of that, that German influence that's coming over and taking over. Uh, Kashub actually means keepers of wealth. Uh, it was originally called an insult um, because wealth wasn't necessarily a popular thing. However, the keepers of wealth thing is pretty interesting because we're talking about an area that's rich in amber. And so it is a major commodity along the Baltic coast and down the Vistula River. And so it provided not only wealth for these people, but it provided an ec economy and something that the rest of the world wanted, alongside with potash and a couple of other different um, commodities that were produced in the area. So the Baltic Christians didn't Christianize everybody. It spent, they spent a long time in the area defeating these pagan tribes. And so this area that's behind the wall that you see, and apart from Kashubians, is your Baltic tribes. Uh, these populations are said to have combined with Kashubia over the years. Uh, there are the Kirpi in the south and in the Soviet area down there, and then there's the Kashubians on the east. And these are the only two populations that are supposed to, or have reported to survive this entire time. Um, however, there is a lot of speculation and a lot of con conjecture uh, you know, when, when talking about this, because we don't have a lot of evidence. 
However, we do know that these people existed, and people don't just disappear, right? And so we have a lot of these influences crossing borders, movement of migration, and you'll never know exactly which original tribe are your family or, or your ancestors came from, but it's just important to know that all of these populations did exist, and they had their own culture way before Christianity. So one of the important things that I talk about is the Griffin Dynasty. And the Griffin Dynasty is a collection of people. It started with Eric of Pomerania. He was a Kashubian. And his mother was the queen of Sweden at the time. Uh, so she gave the kingship of Sweden over to her son, and they created what's called the Griffin Dynasty. Uh, it's a part of the Hanseatic League, this economic system that we'll talk about. Um, but this is an original stone carving of the uh, of the Kashubian crest. Okay, and so it has all of the different kingdoms represented on the, the nine different uh, panels there. And what it is is Sweden, Denmark, Norway, the island of Rugen, Pomerania, Kashubia, Pomerelia, that entire Baltic area. Uh, if you, you Genealogists, we talk amongst each other and we call this area the neighborhood. Uh, it is not necessarily one individual country at the time because nations didn't exist. Uh, but they were traveling uh, by boat to each country. Uh, we even know that Thaddeus Kuschisko ended up in Sweden after a, his American tour. And so there's this constant relationship that, that the Kashubians have with Sweden and the Swedish Empire. Uh, and that is often why we get these different Swedish implements into the Kashubian culture, right? Um, it's often stated that this is like Sweden in, in certain ways. And it definitely is because over the next 500 years, Sweden will definitely be involved in almost every war and every political structure that's developed in the Kashubian region. The castle was for Kashubia, or this Griffin dynasty, uh, began here at the, at the castle of Steshen. Uh, this is on the eastern edge, or the western edge, excuse me, of, of Poland today. Um, and so this castle is very important. Uh, it's uh, one of the sources that we use. Uh, there is only one book that we'll talk about later, but it's The Slippery Memory of Men, and that's what it's titled. And so it's a constant issue with, uh, with history, with academics, scholarship, and our colleges and universities around the country that refuse or ignore this history. Uh, so those are some of the original seals and original coins that are developed. Uh, there is a Kashubian griffin on each one of those pieces. And it uh, is a, the beginning of a, of a long lost dynasty. Uh, it's pretty interesting. And so this is the map, and I'm gonna show you a lot of maps today. Um, I like maps, I think it's a good way to analyze history, good way to show representation of what's going on. Um, maps do lie, so this one is one representation where it's color coded, and you can see that the, the entire Vistula River and the entire Kashubian area is involved in that Hanseatic League. And this is just an economic uni union of guilds. Right? It's a gilded system. It's controlled. Uh, one of the things they did was they standardized the coinage system. And so a fenning, a five, would be worth the same no matter where you went throughout this area. Even in, it would even be the same in England and in Russia. And what that does is it prevents money changing, uh, it standardizes the system, and it standardizes economy, their economy. However, in this area, their battle chant, uh, instead of Bogorodija, which is the uh, standard Hussar chant or march uh, song that they would sing on the way uh, for increasing mor morale and all that kind of stuff. Uh, there is, uh, so it's Bogo Rydija in Poland, but it's Boda up in the north. And what that means is freedom and liberty. And so as far back as the 1230s, we were starting to begin talking about these concepts of freedom and liberty that is normally associated with the United States, but this is four or 500 years before when we're starting to reconcile these concepts and learn about them and start implementing them towards our population. Uh, this is why you have a elected Polish king and certain golden liberties is because of this original foundation that they built off of. <coughs> uh, this is a little better map that produces the same Hanseatic League and you can see the trade routes going all over into southern Poland, into other areas, Lithuania, Russia, and then all the way up into England. Uh, this is uh, why you will also find griffins in the English Empire on certain crests and different things, is because we are moving back and forth, okay? Um, the, the people aren't static, they don't just sit in one place. Uh, and so our ancestors were always traveling, always moving from town to town, always marrying outside of town, 
And so there is this constant movement of, of ideas and, and things, even, as, even way back then. Um, and it's not something that we necessarily think about. Most renditions of Polish people are a, uh, or a Kashubia in general is that it's a vast wasteland, but nothing but a bunch of farmers. Uh, that is something that I intend to change. Uh, I, I do not like the Zosh Shablem era of immigration that we, that we talk about, or even the recent American Pickle on TV that calls to Polish people the stupidest people on earth. Uh, these are misnomers about Poland that I'd really like to spend the rest of my career trying to fix and trying to mend. All right. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, so one of the things I talk about when it comes to Kashubia in general, general is, the, is the Battle of Grunwald. Okay, the Battle of Grunwald in 1410 was a time when Poland was gaining back and fighting the Teutonic Knights that they had once allowed in. Uh, they were getting too um, rambunctious, and so they, the, there was a disagreement, and they wanted to take that land back. However, that did not include the city of Bitov. Uh, Bitov was controlled by the Teutonic Knights, and that is why you have the Teutonic Cross on the uh, Bitov crest. Okay, so it's originally a Teutonic Knights castle, and at this time, during the, fort, the Battle of Grunwald, it is owned by the Teutonic Knights and is stationed as a Teutonic Knight castle. However, after the Battle of 1410, there was a treaty, the first treaty of uh, uh, Torin, excuse me, uh, that gave this to Poland, and so the Duché of Pomerania became a Fife system of Poland through this. However, they had to return that whole land back to the Teutonic Knights, and it wasn't until the Second Treaty of Thorn before this officially became a part of Poland. However, it wasn't really a part of Poland because of that five system, right? And so it took another 400 years, or another couple hundred years after this, uh, for them to actually become controlled by Poland. And so all of the different government systems, how the social structure worked, all of that stuff is controlled by the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and not necessarily Poland. Uh, even though there is that influence and taxes was paid to the Polish kingdom, a lot of those <coughs> systems are still in that Germania, Slavica area. Uh, the picture on the right is actually mine. Uh, it shows a white griffin on the, on the right and a lion on the left. Uh, this is from uh, as far back as I can reach in my history, uh, doing genealogy, this is where I've gotten, uh, to Grismala the third. And so I know that he was a part of the Griffin dynasty, split off in 1410, and he was given a last name because when we're talking about genealogy, this is right around the time that the Catholic Church is starting to require surnames, okay? And so this is about as far back as, the, as you can get when it comes to genealogical yeah. records, church records, and things like that. Uh, if you go back farther than this, you're more than likely relying on certain legends and folklore to get farther back in time. Um, but we do actually have church records that go up to this point. Um, so I've, I've done my research and I, I found him. And this process right from right here is where my history and Bitov history kind of splits for a while. Um, because Bitov remains a part of Pomerania, while as my family is in the Royal Prussian area. And that's actually what that means, that symbol, that's what the press means, is Prus I. Uh, and it's a designation given by the king. Uh, so he came to Turin for the second peace treaty, uh, the king did, and what he, what he did is he basically pointed at people and named them after where they were standing, uh, or where they were from. And so my name, Turkowski, is actually just river bend. Uh, that's all it means, there's that extreme bend in the river of Torn. So it's this split right here, and you can see, uh, let me see if I can figure this out. Yeah. So you can see right here, this little lip right here, where Bitov is sectioned off from the rest of the country. And there was a specific reason for that. Uh, uh, the, the castle was a, uh, a monumental place, a, a very uh, important strategic military outpost, um, and so it was given back to the Duché. Um, that was just one of the things that they had to, to reconcile during these series of treaties between the Teutonic Knights and themselves. However, the Royal Prussia and the Duke, the Ducal of Prussia, is also formed at this time. And so Vitov was taken by Poland. This is just a Pretty much what I just described, but it gives you some dates. Uh, taken by Poland in 1410, returned in 1411. Then you have a series of Polish Teutonic Wars, the second peace of Turin in 1466, and, six, and it's finally given to the Dukes of Pomerania as an inheritable mean. When that nobility dies out, this is when the Pomeranian 
or Griffin Dynasty actually dies out completely. Okay, so it dies out in 1637, and that just means that there was no nobility left. So whoever was getting that hereditary system uh, to own the place or to take charge of the place, they were not, um, they had no more kids or no more relatives left, and so they had to give it up. And at that point is when Bithoff and Pomerania become a part of Poland, directly ruled by Poland. Uh, and so it's from this point, really, where we have that com combining history uh, where Kashubians and Polish people start to become one. Uh, this map is pretty important. I, I think that it gets us thinking about uh, religion and the, the differences in culture. Uh, because when I talk about people or when I talk about Kashubia, I don't really want to focus on the uh, academics of uh, government. I, I don't really care about who's the king in charge. I don't really care about um, all of these head guys that are up there. What I care about is what the people are doing. Mm -hmm. And that was what I wanted to learn most. I want to know what our grandparents were doing, what the bottom guys were doing, what the laborers were up to. Uh, and so what I did was is I went through religion because it's an easy way to track people. Because uh, are naturally Catholic. Um, and so what you have during this time uh, is a hundred years war, thirty years war, and all of these foreign battlefields in Europe where the Protestant Reformation is taking over and creating these, these problematic issues, right? Um, fighting with Catholics and different things like that. But what the, one of the most interesting things is, is that if you notice up in the Danzig area, um, there is no Catholic. It is not mainly Catholic. And so the, the, the the area that you see is mostly Lutheran at this time, or Calvinist. Um, the importance of that is that during this time, the leaders were also becoming Lutheran and, and getting rid of their Catholic belief systems. Um, and so what that does is that it prompts them to form uh, the Treaty of Stetchen in 1653. And this, the Pomeranian Pomeran nobility has already died out. Uh, it's the Thirty Years' War. And so what happens is the Sweden comes in and says, we want this area. We, we have been a part of it for so long uh, that it actually belongs to us. And Germany says that it belongs to them. And so they split it up. The western part of, of Pomerania actually becomes um, Swedish Pomerania in this area here. And then the rest of the orange area right there actually becomes a part of the Brandenburg, Germany. <laughs> But one of the most important treaties that I think is often forgotten when we talk about this history is the Treaty of Weilu. It's also called the Treaty of Bromberg. It's also called the Treaty of Vigosh. Uh, but it happened in 1657. And these Lutheran leaders, these Lutheran Prussian leaders and the Kingdom of Sweden, uh, bas basically made a deal with Poland that if they were to supply troops for the war, Poland had to agree to take away the nobility of all Catholics. So all Catholic people in 1657 no longer have nobility, they no longer have the right to own land, and they no longer have the right to own businesses. Um, what that does is it pushes all of these Catholic populations out to the countryside and they become a servant class society. Uh, this is where a lot of the uh, labor practices come from, where a lot of our traditions come from, is this area of time. Because I did a lot of research when it comes to like our old music, our old folklore, um, and in that book, Kashubian Civilization, all of the songs represent something that has to do with serfdom. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of upsetting, uh, it's a little uneasy, but our songs are, we take our ride to the masters, uh, we take our ride to the master's house, and we are trying to please the master so that he gives us good gifts in return, and treats us well for the rest of the year, because if you don't produce that harvest and produce money for the master, then you're not gonna do so well. And it's almost in every, it, it, it resembles the African American slave songs. It really does. Um, I'm not saying that it is the same as slavery because it's different. Uh, there are some differences, especially when it comes to breeding and allowing families to stay together. However, their system does exist and it is pretty violent. Um, it resembles slavery so much that in the old newspapers, that's what they call it. They call it Polish slavery. Uh, yeah, if, and if uh, you're looking to check any of this information or further your knowledge on this information, this book is pretty expensive. Uh, this guy is from the University of Arizona, but it is one of the only books that does cover this history uh, it, with any kind of comprehension. Um, and it's called The Slippery Memory of Men. I did mention it before. I think that's totally fitting for the Kashubian history in general or the Griffin Dynasty because 
it's not calculated when it comes to themes of nationalism or these bigger themes of grand, or grand narratives, of, as I call them, in history. Uh, so it's not taught in the universities, it's not taught in colleges, it's not call, taught in, in high schools. Um, in fact, I think this is probably one of the only places besides Paul Milliman's class uh, that you can actually get this information. <coughs> so skipping forward quite a few hundred years, um, what we have is that Poland was a part of that Kashubian part that whole time, uh, interacting with each other, influencing, but it is separated by a mountain range, right? So we're not sharing all of our language, we're not sharing all of our culture, and most of the population is still serfs. And so what we're doing is we're developing our own community culture within our own cities and underneath this serfdom system. However, by 1700, we have what's called the Northern Wars. And in Northern Wars, Shubi was occupied by Sweden, again. And so those, that continued Swedish influence reaches into the 1700s. And so our leaders, our masters, uh, the, the serf owners would all be Swedish at this time. Uh, interesting fact is that this is a time of a Kashubian civil war with Poland. Uh, there was a guy that was called Stanislaw Lezeski. Uh, he was supported by Sweden, and he was twice the king of Poland at, at, as an elected king. Uh, once in 1704, and then again in 1733. Each time he was overthrown and taken out of his seat. Uh, and I think that's important because he was a Kashubian king. Uh, his grandmother's name was Jablonski, and his father's name was obviously Lysinski, but he was from the northern area right around Gdansk. And so the civil war continued between King Augustus III, who was the Polish king in Warsaw, and what he had was Russian backing. The entire Russian army was on his side. And so he figured that he could just overthrow the elected king and remain king of Poland. Uh, so he sieged, uh, the, when King the Stanislaw Lysinski was elected king again, uh, he took off and went to Gdansk for refuge. And so the Polish King Augustus and the Russian Tsars uh, took a siege on Gdansk and spent an entire, like, 15 years uh, until they uh, assassinated the other king and took over control. What this does is it fractures Poland. Okay, not only are we still fractured by Silesians, Ruthenians, Galicians, Kirpi, Kashubians, and all the rest of the nationalities of Poland, um, but we are then fractured again because half of us elected this king, the other half elected King Augustus III, and one of them just went to Russia and said we're going to take over and use the Russian military to do so. Uh, and that's why you don't have a lot of people wanting to fight for Poland at this time. You don't have a lot of people wanting to keep Poland together at this time because it's very fractured, very different, very split between religions, culture, and politics. And so you get a partition of Poland. And most of you guys know this story. Uh, Germany, Austria, and Russia all take a third of Poland and make it their own. What happens at this time is that anybody that's not in a servant class position that has any form of nobility, and they are Polish or Slavic, they become a serfdom class again. Um, and so this pushes us back down to the beginning parts. And what I mean by servant class is not necessarily that they're just farmers. Uh, but I do mean that they're not allowed to own anything. And so anything that they do is uh, going to make somebody else money. Um, and so it becomes that servant class population. Uh, this is just another map that, that depicts the different uh, populations. And you can see there, uh, on this page alone, there's about 22 different populations that are being split up. And each one of those populations has their own history that I think is important and different from the grand narrative of Polish history. Because when Polish history is spoken about, most people are talking about the area of Warsaw, up here, somewhere. Anyway, Warsaw. And uh, they're often are talking about Prussia, Russian Poland at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the history comes from. So we're talking about the big governments, the kings, all of the things that are going on in Warsaw, not necessarily what's going on with the rest of Poland. And so Kaiser Francis owns the green area there, and Kaiser Wilhelm owns everything <coughs> north of that, and then you have the Russian Tsars on the other side. These are three different countries at this point. These are three different areas that deserve their own historical analysis and individual. So if, depending on where you're from, that's gonna change your immigration history. Um, that's gonna change all the different aspects that, that, that impacted your family. Um, and so when you look at these records, uh, you need to look in Germany, if you're from Kashubia, 
because that is where the records are kept. Uh, often your records will be stored in Berlin or, or some other place like that. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're German, but that you're a part of this German empire at this time. So you're not going to find any of your records in Poland. They will all be in German, unless you're from that other side of the, uh, other side of the country. Uh, one of the things that I do like to talk about is the myth of Ellis Island. Uh, even on, in some of our museum displays, it talks about Castle Garden being the place where people immigrated to, and that's just not true. About 10 to 12 million immigrants went through Castle Garden and Ellis Island and passed the Statue of Liberty that was built in 1866, I believe, or yeah, something like that. Um, but Polish people pro processed by Polish port authorities. Uh, your name wasn't changed at that point. I, I hear that a lot when people come through the museum that, oh, well, my, my parents must have had their name changed through Castle Garden or these different things, and that's not how it happened. <laughs> Uh, Germanization in Poland during that time when they were partitioned is why those names changed from Polowski to Paler or uh, Pintowski to Pine and all, a lot of those different German variations of names. But it happened over there. It did not happen here. So when you would come in and you would get processed, you'd get processed by somebody that spoke your own language. It just makes sense that if you're going to have massive documents that need to be written in a foreign language, that you would have somebody that speaks that foreign language actually doing that. Uh, a lot of the names do get changed in the United States, but they are changed by census enumerators. And that means that when somebody comes and takes a census every 10 years, like they do, uh, they are just writing down what they hear. And so you will often fi find in genealogical records that that is the change that happens, is that they are sounding it out as they are writing it and not, and not asking the person how to spell it. So how and where did these immigrants arrive and what do immigrant records tell us? They tell us a lot. But these are the major 40 ports, or there are 40 major U.S. ports during this time that you can actually immigrate to, okay? It's not just Castle Garden. There's the port of Baltimore, which is where most Kashubians entered to, as well as Quebec. Quebec is the other major port that Kashubians used. And the reason is because they were using the Hamburg Maritime Company, uh, shipping company, that that's where they ported to, that's where they were taking their goods to. Um, very minimum, if there are any from Castle Garden, I haven't actually seen an early Kashubian immigrant come from Castle Garden. Um, and that's because all of these people were being, their, their ship ride was free. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, because the ship ride was free, they were only using the one port and then transferring to those normal shipping patterns. So you wouldn't have Castle Garden necessarily. But there are other places, there's the port of Galveston, that takes a lot of Silesians, New Orleans, San Francisco, and really across the nation. Uh, and not only that, but when you're coming in from Canada, you'll often find records where your parents immigrated from North Dakota, or, or straight into the Midwest. Um, so they are crossing into Canada through the ports, ending up in Canada for a little while. And what happened is, is that the Canadian government was using Shubian populations as well. Um, and they were transporting into these settlements and homesteads and making them try and colonize the area, if you will. Um, but uh, what happened was is that most of the waterways in Canada were too far away from this farmland, and it was very unsuccessful. They didn't work. Uh, they even tried getting an overland steamship, so an overland train, uh, to pass the, the goods to the to get them to the waterway. But by the time they got to the waterways and got the goods to the market, most of their stuff was bad and it was rotten. And so they couldn't use it, couldn't sell it, and couldn't make any money that way. And so they gave up their homesteads and traveled to places like Detroit, Milwaukee, Minnesota, and other places across the Midwest to try and make a new life. Uh, <laughs> this one's always interesting. Um, so what I did was I was looking for why this happens. Okay, why would people leave their home? Poland is a beautiful country. It has everything that we have here. Uh, yes, there's some political differences and political strife, but ultimately, what's going on? What would make somebody want to leave their home? It just didn't make a lot of sense to me that we would come to this idea that America is the greatest place on earth, even though we didn't know it. We would risk a boat ride that was six weeks long and not sure if we would make it. You're not sure if you can practice Catholicism in the United States. You're not sure what religion is allowed here, where, depending on where you end up. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. So what would make somebody want to do that? So I did some digging. 
And what I found was a lot of letters between Secretary of State William H. Seward and the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. And what you find in the Library of Congress is this note that, and this is a series of notes, this is one of the most important ones, um, but it talks about how they were trying to get these populations to come over to the United States because of labor. Mm -hmm. uh, 1864, especially after the end of slavery, the United States did not know what to do. Uh, they had mass labor shortages all around the country, and not only that, they were trying to move west. And so they needed populations to populate those towns along the way uh, in order to take care of certain things. And so this letter says, sir, in view of the fact that enlistments at home are progressing somewhat slowly, I beg leave to submit to your consideration the following suggestions. At the end of the present month, a very large number of Prussian soldiers whose term of active service will then have expired will be dismissed. On the part of many of those thus expecting to be discharged, applications are made to the legation procedure for them to free passage to the United States. Uh, and so what, it, what existed at this time is that you have major business owners buying the, that passage, okay? Uh, and what happens is if you're Vanderbilt, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, some of these big names that you've already heard uh, in American history are buying these populations, okay? So uh, there's a lot of debate right here because there's the idea that it's just America that's doing this um, and just America that's providing this and that it's an accepted and voluntarily uh, voluntary action that's being made on, on, the, on the part of the Kashubian people. However, we have to remember that we are not free. We are a serfdom population, okay? And so Kaiser Wilhelm owns us, and that's when he took over, that's basically what him and Kaiser Francis said. And so I have documents from 1838 all the way through 1850s and 60s out of England, because that's the only people that are publishing it, that talks about how uh, Kaiser Francis especially never gave the Polish people enfranchisement. Even though you have the 1806 Constitution that's requiring it, even though you have all of these big government policies going into play, it does not uh, apply to the Kashubian or country folk populations. And so they are bought and sold. It's, uh, it's an auction that happens often, especially in, with Kaiser Francis in Silesia and our friends over in Wisconsin. Uh, but for us in specific, it was a Prussian authoritarian welfare state that when you can read Dr. Max Weber's uh, entire 1894 article that talks about how these ethnic Poles or Kashubians uh, were a problem. And so his father, the Eastern Prussian Railway owner, uh, made a system where they would transport people to Poznan and teach them how to run railroad or steel industry stuff. In the south, in Silesia, it was coal mines. And so they would train them at coal mines. And it was all about industrializing Germany. Uh, and so this is, is right after that in the Immigration Act of 1864. This is from President Lincoln himself. And he says, I again submit to your consideration for the expediency of the established system uh, for immigration. And really it's just this admittance, open admittance, that we're using Prussia to increase and transport the Kashubian people to the United States. Uh, if you think about the term, who built Winona, which is our main display exhibit in the museum, this is what we're talking about, okay? You have a population that comes and they are being positioned to be laborers for the United States. Uh, they are not given upper level jobs often. They are not given uh, a chance to really build businesses and do these things on their own until that contract is up. Uh, so once you do your contract two, three years, you can go and make something of yourself in America, that old bootstrap saying. Uh, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, and that's exactly what they had to do. But it's important to know that any Kashubian that does make it in that area uh, had to work their butt off uh, and really do everything from the ground up and had often no social structure, no social welfare, or anything to help them along the way. Uh, they did it all by themselves. And so this is that Prussian Eastern Railway, Railway the original. And this is the first line that comes through Kashubia. And this one, I think, is more important, so we can just skip ahead. Uh, what you can see is that the red lines are from before 1875, the gray dotted partition borders in the center there, and then the black lines are railroads that are built after 1876 to 1914. You can see that the Germany and Austrian covered areas are the where the industrialism is happening. This is the area of Posen, okay? 
It is not a city, it's not a country, it's really not even a designated area. What it's referring to is the Polish people in this German partition. Uh, a lot of people think that it's uh, around the area of Poznan. However, Poznan is just a general political term that means that I'm Polish living in these Germanic states. And so what we have is a, a system of Junkers, or Junkers, up in northern Germany. And these Junkers are the ones that are defying the government policies and doing whatever they want. Uh, if you study Junkers at all, they own a manor system. It's much like a plantation that is in the United States, right? And so we have a main house with several populations living around that same house. And all of those servant populations are there to, to make the manor money. And so my family was owned by the Volprecht family for about 35 years before they were transferred to Poznan to work on the railroads. And if you look, we're talking about railroads here. This is 1830 to 1850 in the United States, before Prussian immigration, before Kashubian immigration. And then all of a sudden during the 1860s, it starts to expand. Uh, one of the important notes that I note from this map down here on the bottom is that this is Winona right here, right at the end of the railroad. Uh, so what you have is, is a, a system of government, the Airmet, excuse me, the American Immigrant Company, uh, coming in and forcing these populations to move here. They would put them on a train, and then they would go to the end of the railway. At the end of the railway, you have what's called lumber barons here in Winona, and also uh, in the railroad company as well. So if I own 500 acres of this glorious woods out here, and I wanted to do something with it and make money, I could go ahead and do it by myself, but that's probably not gonna make a lot of money. What I need to do is find a labor force. And so I would import these people, buy them from the American Immigrant Company, and bring proper labor to the area. Uh, and what that would do is allow me to have a cheap labor force that often works for free, paying back that original contract, However, most systems in place, even through Minnesota and through the United States, what they did was, is took that contract, and after about, you were done with half of it, they would make it so that you couldn't complete it. Uh, and so, you know, for an example, in a lumber company, you would say, you have to give me 500 logs every year. So if you reach 499 in December and take a vacation and don't give me that last one, your contract's null and void and you have to start over. So you have to work for me for another year for free. Uh, this could happen up to 15 years. Um, it, it was a serious um, ordeal. It's being commonly uh, depicted in books today called Contracting Freedom, uh, Reinventing Free Labor. Uh, there's several different books that are out there that are available to talk about how this system affected uh, Slavic people and people across the United States. Uh, 1880s, you see that, again an expansion, but really it just gets thicker and thicker checkerboarded across the northern states. And it's important to understand that this was Slavic labor that created this. Now, they are the ones out in the fields picking with axes. They are the ones out shoveling. They are the ones out doing the hard labor to get these things created. Uh, notice that while the Chinese and African Americans are often depicted as doing a lot of this labor, there isn't very many railroads in their area. And so while that treatment was uh, indeed um, hostile and, and wrong, uh, it's also important to recognize what the Slavic people were doing at the same time. Just because they blend in or can be assimilated easier, easier doesn't mean that our situation doesn't matter, and it doesn't mean that what was done to us shouldn't be spoken about. Uh, and our, it, it really should. So the, all of this happened up until 1885. And I think what's important about the Foreign Act uh, is that it put a restriction on immigrants not only in literacy, uh, but what it did in Germany and what the effects are of American politics when we do these things and how it affects other countries. Uh, so the continued deportion was happening during this area to clean out northern Poland of Slavic people. However, in the United States, when they shut down this process and eliminated contract labor, uh, what happened is an additional 30,000 Kashubians were deported into the area of Lodz. And so when you talk about Gdansk in World War I and World War II and how there's a majority of Germans up there and a majority of German population, this is why they got rid of us. They were deporting us all the way through this the, before World War II, before World War I. And this is just a, a little side story. 
Captain Peter Kavasa is a Silesian. He's from the southern part of Poland. <coughs> and when he got here, he was contracted to work in the iron mines of Texas. Uh, so he went down there, he worked a couple of years, contracted his freedom, but ended up as a Confederate, drafted into the Confederate Army for the first three months of the war. He was captured by one of our uh, members' grandfathers, Anton Paler, and sent to a POW camp. And it was actually Anton Paler's unit that captured him down on the Mississippi River. Uh, they sent him to a POW camp, and he changed sides, signed a piece of paper that denounced the Confederacy and spoke about fighting for against slavery and all of these other policies. So he became the captain of an African-American cavalry unit in 1863. He was very successful throughout the war with this unit, uh, several battles that were won, and it's a really interesting story if you're interested in war history. However, the important thing is that after the war in 1864, he ended up in Chicago with Kashubian and Silesian immigrants, and those immigrants developed the St. Stanislaus Society. Uh, this society was meant to take care of those contract laborers. If you could not afford anything, if you couldn't afford food, you had uh, orphans, you had widows, you had elderly. Uh, this church organization actually stepped in and took care of all of those responsibilities when there was no system to do so. Uh, there was no social programs in the United States to take care of people. And so they formed together these little societies to be able to take care of one another. And I think that is extremely important when it comes to the development of our society and the different things that we do and how we take care of one another. Yeah. And there is, and that's the original saint, uh, they call it the mother church. Uh, but you can know that any St. Stanislaw church in the United States stems from this original Kashubian and Silesian population. So it doesn't matter whether it's in Buffalo, Chicago, Winona, uh, or even as far as California and Washington, there are some St. Stanislaus that come up there. These are all Kashubian people. And that's how... Uh, <laughs> And it's important to, to talk about Father Brazen and this community as well. Um, it is, he is what is Kashubian as well. Um, developing this museum, developing from, uh, you know, basically nothing, picking stuff up out of the trash. Uh, I think it's important to, uh, when talking about Kashubian Unity Day, and especially here in Winona, this is the Kashubian capital of the United States. Um, if it wasn't for this place, I would not know anything about my history. Uh, and I think that that's really important. Uh, Jones Island has been destroyed, it's been concreted over. Places in Detroit, uh, my personal family history from Detroit is that Henry Ford in 1911 developed the social welfare program, took all of our stuff, all of our immigrant books, anything that we brought from Poland, threw it in the backyard and lit it on fire. He did not want Kashubians or Polish people in general to be speaking their own language or promoting their own culture, they had to be American. And so they offered him $5 a day to go work for him and he took it. However, he never got paid five dollars a day. Um, he got paid about two fifty a day, about half the wages. And what Henry Ford would do is he said, "Well, you speak Kashubian, not English. That's fifty cents. Uh, you don't eat your peas with a fork and knife. You eat it with a spoon. That's fifty cents. Uh, you promote your culture. You teach your kids. Is your wife speaking English? All of these different things about your home life created a, a, a negative deficit on your pay and income." Um, and that was a way that he assimilated the population. But what it did was it took away everything that I could have used to look at my family history. Um, and there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing. You even go into Detroit today, and there is a Polish uh, 1920s and, and above influence, but there is no original Kashubian museum or artifacts or anything that exists. Uh, what we do have is the ashes below the John D. Dingle Veterans Center. And that is the only thing that we have left. Um, so the fact that Father Rizzo is here to be able to do this for us and to create this long-lasting museum uh, that showcases Kashubian history and showcases the story, I think is one of the most honorable and, uh, excuse me, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> The 50 years of dedication that he, that he gave to this museum allows not only me, but my children and my family to rediscover something that was forever lost, or at least that we thought was forever lost. And, and so I just thank him uh, almost every day for the, for the contributions and his dedication 
Um, and not only that, but continuing on in the research through going to BitTalk and, and bringing that stuff back uh, that continues to be a big part of my life. And that's why I'm here, uh, is to continue on and tr to try and continue that teaching lesson to, so that we can all understand Kashubian history. Thank you for watching the presentation from the Polish Museum on Kashubian Unity Day. Please remember to stop by our museum and check out all the changes and the different things that we're doing. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and to see all of our other social media platforms. Uh, thanks again for appreciating and watching and thank you for all your time and I'll see you next time.